Light is both a particle and a wave. It's really one of the first things we learn in chemistry and physics. And sure, our textbooks present us with experiments showing that light is in fact a particle and a wave, wouldn't you want to know exactly how scientists came up with their experiments? Came up with their theories? What were the events leading to the greatest scientific breakthroughs in history? How did Thomas Young know how small he had to make a slit to see light construct and deconstruct? Why did we think of light as a particle if it doesn't even have mass? And if it were a wave, how come it doesn't bend at corners just like sound or water? How did we come from knowing absolutely nothing about light to using it to power our homes, to using it to know what something is made of, and to even making our own light when it's already dark? When we think of light today, we think particles, waves, energy, frequency, wavelength, intensity. We're essentially describing something that allows us to know what our surroundings look like. Something that plants need to make food. Something that can be absorbed by another something. Something! But if we'd go way back to 400 BCE, light wasn't something. Rather, it was a state of transparency. A state that's necessary for seeing to be possible. At least that's what Aristotle believed. Which is weird because today we think of transparency as the ability of material to let light pass through it. In other words, light was a state of being able to see through something. This would be one of the first things you could say about light because it was obvious. The less light you have, the less you can see. Light would then become intertwined with vision and the eye. And an obvious thing you can observe with the eye is that sparkle. As if something came out of the eye, a detector that went back and allowed us to see. Although this doesn't explain why it's harder to see in the dark. If we had our own detectors, then we should still be able to read in the dark. There was another person named Hero who noted something about the speed of light. Oftentimes, we don't get to observe light bend or change direction, and so thought of light to have infinite velocity. In a place where a discus throwing was a thing and is in fact the birthplace of the Olympics, he observed that objects thrown with a higher initial velocity tended to stay in horizontal motion, as compared to a weakly thrown object. This was when math started to get into describing this state of transparency. And maybe now you're wondering why people even cared about this thing called light. While well, light practically controlled everyone's lives, the presence and absence of it divided the day into two parts consistently. If you were in ancient Greece having nothing to do the whole day, wouldn't you yourself be intrigued about this thing? Eventually, Euclid set the very first geometric perspective on sight. He set down the rule that for two objects of unequal sizes, there are points that make their apparent sizes equal. For us, it's pretty much common sense, but the math behind this is actually laying foundation for the science behind light. Let's go to 1000 AD. This was the time the Holy Roman Empire insisted on studying the afterlife rather than the natural sciences, that they stoned a woman all because she had books about ellipses. On the other hand, the Islam Empire preserved their books and even had one on brain surgery. Here Ibn al-Haytham or al-Hazen was invited to regulate the flow of the Nile River. When he realized that his plan was impractical, he got scared because the ruler at the time was brutal. So he faked his insanity and got sent to house arrest for 10 years. But after all that, he spent his time teaching math and physics. Alhazen would be the first to combine experiment with reasoning. He basically established experimentation as a norm in the field of optics, requiring them to be systematic and repeatable. Alhazen then proposed that our sight is based on the fact that objects radiate their own light. He hung two lanterns at different points. Light from each lantern illuminated a different spot in the room, and each lighted spot formed a direct line with the hole. He found that covering a lantern caused the spot it illuminated to darken, and exposing a lantern caused the spot to reappear, thus proving that objects do radiate their own light. Come 1600s, René Descartes, a lawyer who spent 10 years as a soldier, had an encounter with Dutch philosopher and scientist Isaac Beekman, who was said to have rekindled his interest in the sciences. When he left to join the Catholic army, he was said to have three dreams that pushed him to change the current methods of reasoning. It was because of Descartes that someone mechanized light. For the first time, he thought of light in terms of its properties. As he did the most things, such as heat and moisture can be explained by talking about matter and motion. He made use of quantities, emphasizing the geometry of things with sizes and shapes. At around the same time, we mentioned Robert Hooke, a kid who drew with so much detail that his dad thought he would become a successful clockmaker. Although he didn't become a clockmaker, he was able to use his skills to design instruments, such as the compound microscope, the first kind that was crew operated. Here's one of his drawings as he used the microscope to look at objects. He also made use of air and liquid pressed between two glass plates. He saw colors change by increasing and relaxing pressure. 
Simultaneously, Isaac Newton, like Descartes, also read materials aside from the heavily implemented Aristotelian philosophy. He read on Pierre Gassendia, Robert Boyle, and Henry Moore. The difference between Descartes and Newton is that Descartes merely followed Aristotle's description of color. Newton, on the other hand, thought of these as individual rays with their own different properties. Newton essentially continued Robert Hooke's research after Hooke claimed that his microscope was defective. Newton just so happened to strike upon the perfect lens combination. He was able to measure the distances between the colored rings. As Newton studied colors, he was led to the idea that light is made of particles. White light is made of different colors and each of these have their own properties. They were matter of their own kind. So far, this is what happened. Aristotle thought light wasn't an object, rather a state, allowing us to see more, therefore relating light to the eye. Hero then said light had to have infinite velocity, and Euclid related the apparent sizes of objects with how far they were from us, putting math into the whole picture. A lot of years later, Elhazen started experimenting on light and discovered that it was in fact something that objects radiated. Descartes, who always looked at things like heat and coldness as products of matter in motion, then applied this idea to light, that it too was matter in motion. Hooke, on the other hand, was experimenting on light, specifically with colors he saw under the microscope, while Newton came up with a lens combination that allowed him to measure the distances between the colors Hooke saw. Fast forward to the 1770s, we check on Thomas Young. Thomas Young's profession was medicine, working on the mechanisms of human sight, dealing with light and colors. At the same time, he was studying the human voice, and there he saw a resemblance between light and sound, that they both had wave-like properties. He is now known for the double slit experiment, but where did he get the measurements to set up the experiments? How did he know how small he had to make the slits? He actually based them on Newton's work on colors. But this wasn't all of it. What was missing from Young's experiment was a discussion of his computations. He did give a verbal explanation that when two portions of the same light arrive at the eye by different paths, the light becomes more intense when the difference of the path is any multiple of a certain length and least intense in the intermediate state of interfering portions. Around that time, Augustin Fresnel was an engineer for the French government, and so at the time when many people joined Napoleon during the French Revolution. Fresnel lost his engineering post and had to be put under police surveillance. This gave Fresnel free time to start experimenting on light, a subject he was always fascinated about. Eventually, Napoleon was defeated during the Battle of Waterloo, giving Fresnel back his engineering job. This meant that he could only do experiments on his vacation days, and so he often requested leave to spend time to work on light. He wasn't even aware of the latest discoveries in optics, especially how the corpuscular theory was the accepted theory at the time. He conducted experiments with a diffractor and came up with a formula that pinpointed where the bright and dark lines would appear. He had his paper reviewed, but one of the members pointed out that if a parallel beam of light hits a spherical object, there should be a bright spot in the middle so bright that it was as if there was no obstacle at all. A little bit later, François Arago was able to present the spot and thus further strengthening Fresnel's theory. By the 1900s and at the age of 16, Einstein was always obsessed with the idea of racing alongside a light beam. And when he was working in a patent office, he would rush finishing applications and spend his time daydreaming about the light beam. He discovered something from Maxwell's equations that light would remain at constant speed no matter where it was. This violated Newton's law of motion because that meant light had an absolute velocity, regardless of where it was. This contradicts what we think about motion, that it's always relative to something. I mean, how can you tell that something moved a certain distance when you have no reference point? His discovery eventually led to the idea that time is relative, that the laws of nature may be the same in other planets, but time isn't. This wasn't why Einstein won a Nobel Prize in physics. Instead, it was because of the photoelectric effect. Here we see that electrons move depending on the energy of the photon hitting it, showing its particle. This energy depends on its frequency, with frequency being a property of a wave. There's so much more to understand about nature, and I hope this video is able to show you an outline of one of the most fascinating concepts in science. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time. Hi, if you want more science, click subscribe. You can also check out my videos on quantum physics and quantum computers, right over here and here.